Good morning, good morning. Oh, I'm running a bit late today. But I'm going to go the slightly slower way. Because I do like it. And once again, I apologise for the squeaky touch. I haven't had a chance to get around to all in it yet. I will do. Apologise for the squeaky brakes. I don't know what sort of car you, you drive. <laughs> oh, but it's not an old heap like this. Oh dear. This is a converted, uh, what's the word? Uh, mobility car. It's a Peugeot Partner van. And it's got a very large and very square back, which is ideal if you drop the floor slightly for uh, carrying someone in a wheelchair. So it's got, you can you can fold up the back seats and it's got a winch in it, a hoist and a, a points to strap down the wheelchair and everything. Uh, and I bought it second hand because my father had a stroke and he was in a wheelchair. And uh, we got fed up with... Uh, trying to get, get him in and out of the back seat of a car because basically he was very inflexible and uh, um, uh, you know could only stand only put his weight on one leg and even then he wasn't very practiced at doing that so uh, so so we got we got to the point where we can just wheel him straight in and straight out but by the time I uh, bought this car someone had already had it for three years because um, under the motability scheme I think you get a car and you get it serviced and then once it needs an MOT then you have to sell it because it you then you then get a new one you know uh, oh, I've got no fuel so uh, anyway I bought it and it didn't cost much I think it was about it was either three or six thousand pounds I can't remember it was probably six thousand pounds or something but it had only done about 30,000 miles. It's done, it's done, it's just coming up for 100,000 now. And it still goes like a rocket because uh, obviously when it was a motorability car and, uh, oh, look at those geese flying over. Yeah, probably, I don't know if you can see them. But uh, yeah, when it was a motorability car, it was, um, It was driven like like a little old uh, granny was driving it, you know, because it had someone with a with a, on a wheelchair in the back. And I can tell you from personal experience that when you carry someone in a wheelchair, especially someone who's had a stroke who can't really talk, they're forever going ah like you know, <laughs> like like you're driving like you know Luke Skywalker going down uh, to take out the Death Star. And in fact, you're only doing 30 miles an hour, but of course they feel it more because they're in they're in a wheelchair, and their point of view is, you know, my father was a driver all his life. He, I'm sure he couldn't see much from the back there, and I felt I was always doing 90. Plus, you probably know from watching these videos, I'm, I'm not exactly the slowest driver in the world. Anyway, um, for those of you who wanted the sort of details of my. Uh, Dental Law, my brush with Dental Law partnership, uh, you'll have to listen to the one before this because uh, I outlined it all in there and nothing's happened. But um, I did have a brainwave this morning and it arose out of, uh, you know, this is a great thing. You know, the Japanese respect old people because they have a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience and a lot of wisdom. Not always. It doesn't, it's not guaranteed that you're wise because you're old. Uh, many, many members of Parliament prove that. Uh, but uh, if you are uh, reasonably intelligent, clever, quick thinking, got a bit of common sense, etc., then you start to tie up a lot of loose ends as you get older. Uh, sometimes because you've seen things before, and sometimes because you've been thinking about a problem for 10 or 20 years, and you finally come to a, a conclusion that makes sense. And um, <clears throat> I was trying to think of... Uh, this complaint, uh, this complaint that uh, we'd done a root treatment which was mildly uncomfortable, um, but, but which had led to an, alle an allegation of negligence. And uh, it was from someone who believed that basically uh, mercury in fillings is poisonous and uh, fluoride is a, is a, um, a 
conspiracy to poison everybody uh, by putting it uh, in the water, or if not in the water, then in the toothpaste. But mainly, pop poison everybody by putting it in the water supply. So, um, and these people are not as uh, uncommon as you think. The uh, I, I've been in the pressure long enough to see the campaign for the national campaign for fluoride in the water supply handed off to local authorities for a local authority campaign, and then handed back to now handed back to national level because both levels failed to do it, and both levels failed to do it because there's considerable opposition to putting fluoride in the water supply from people who don't understand that it occurs naturally in the water supply in other areas of the world and uh, is not ever taken out on the grounds of uh, threat to health. So basically it's um, the whole thing as an argument is a non-argument. But as far as we can tell, the only thing it does is an essential nutrient for teeth which strengthens their enamel, the enamel against decay and uh, which, is, uh, which is lacking, which is absent in many countries, including this country outside of a certain, certain I think, parts of Scotland and of course Birmingham who have very wisely added it to their uh, water supply years ago and as a result have far less tooth decay than Manchester which is a similar city which um, quite unwisely didn't. Anyway, that's the fluoride argument in a nutshell but the point is that, my point is and my revelation and my tying up of loose ends and my my completing of a part of the jigsaw and my expansion of my working model of life is that um, uh, something I said yesterday but which I was thinking about overnight which is that this woman thinks that my attempts to try and reassure her regarding her, her mild discomfort she had following a slightly overfilled palatal root in a molar, molar endo which was otherwise you know done excellently um, is that um, I'm part of a conspiracy to cover up the truth, which is that it's, you know, it was fucked up and uh, she's been the victim of some heinous uh, crime and conspiracy to cover up, cover it up. Which was, um, <clears throat> you know, wasn't helped by a local dentist called Shane Gordon, who, when um, reviewing it on the back of a postcard, uh, told her it was it was touching the sinus, uh, which doesn't mean anything <laughs> it doesn't it's not it's a totally meaningless phrase the, the only thing it does is it scares patients because they don't understand what you mean by touching the sinus and they can only assume that it's it's a really a terrible thing otherwise why would you have mentioned it you know um, so so I mean not that she ever had sinusitis or any trouble with her sinus or anything and and whether it's in the sinus or not, he's, from his x-rays, it's difficult to say, but, um, you know, even root fillings that go into sinuses and don't give trouble, so. Anyway, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of digressing from the point, which is that, what was this revelation I've had this morning? Well, at the moment there's this big, um, we've got this uh, COP26, uh, big environmental uh, conference in Glasgow coming up in, in about a month or so, and all the world leaders are going to come along and they're going to try and kick the can down the road with regard to carbon emissions because uh, the population has been, uh, you know, scared witless by the likes of Greta Thunberg and everything into thinking that uh, if we don't do something about carbon emissions then we're all, we're going to be living in a, an apocalyptic uh, 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 Arnold Schwarzenegger type, um, you know, wasteland. Uh, a sort of a Mad Max uh, alternate reality and uh, and so there's a great clamour for something to be done and um, not and, and, and they're coming together at the worst time these leaders because they've literally we're just entering a period of stagnation of the economy plus a, a massive uh, consumer price inflation because the money supplies uh, shot up thanks to Rishi Sunak printing money you know out of control and uh, saying no it's fully justified because it's an emergency and now they of course uh, they've they've been at the restaurant they've had the lobster <laughs> and the foie gras and the caviar and now uh, the waiters uh, standing there 
uh, just turned up with a bell on a silver plate. <laughs> so, so next going to have like his autumn statement. I think it's October 27th or something. Where are we now? We're eight to 18, so it's about nine days away. And then the, the uh, Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee has um, has said that, uh, given the very very strong hint that they're going to put up interest rates. Basically, they said that they're going to have to adjust interest rates because the inflation in this country is is high, and they're not prepared to go down the um, American route of sticking their fingers in their ears and saying, no, 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 I can't hear you. Uh, and it's only transitory. They, we've, we've decided pretty much over here that it's not transitory and that we are going to have a, a reputation for fiscal prudence, which uh, is not, you know, which uh, at the very least is, is clears the hurdle set by the Americans, which is like the hurdle on the floor. So, <laughs> so don't hold your hopes out. So, um, they're having this COP meeting at a point where uh, China is very... I don't know whether President Xi will attend because he's got a rolling blackout in his country because um, the winter started early and uh, they need every bit of coal they can get to keep the coal-fired power stations going across China. And uh, because uh, they're not exporting much and the Russians need every drop of natural gas that they've got to keep the... Russian uh, population freezing to death in Siberia and um, they're not exporting much so as a result um, you know and, and uh, solar solar and wind is uh, we've had a, not much wind at all apparently this summer who'd have thought that you know that solar that, that uh, wind farms don't work when there's no wind you know I mean that was actually impossible to predict I, I must have been uh, you know, nobody, uh, nobody, even even Einstein probably wouldn't have realised that when the wind stops blowing, the um, the fans stop <laughs> stop coming around. <laughs> anyway, uh, so as a result, what's happened is that uh, we're very very short of power, and so having a environmental climate designed to uh, cut the carbon emissions, which basically means re- use less coal, less less natural gas, is. Um, you know, it's the absolute worst time to have it. Well, everyone's now talking nuclear. They're talking uh, sodium nuclear instead of uh, uh, uranium. They're talking thorium. Um, all of these, all of these things. Now, you may ask, well, why weren't these alternatives to uranium um, considered in the past? And the answer is, they're no use for nuclear weapons. They can't. What's the use of a nuclear reactor? If you can't, uh, at the same time as you're producing electricity, uh, produce weapons great uh, plutonium, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so really, uranium was only the only ever choice because it, it, it performed two functions. Nobody wants a thorium reactor because you can't make thorium atomic bombs. Or who wants a, one that's uh, cooled by uh, superheated sodium chloride, you know. Because uh, who wants superheated so- sodium chloride? So, anyway, they're finally coming to the realisation that, uh, despite their objections, and the public object to uh, uranium-powered nuclear uh, uh, fission as much as they do to fluoride, practically. Um, Germany is uh, Germany. Germany is in the process of decommissioning all their nuclear power stations, but, but that was because basically. Germany, having having sort of let the side down twice in a hundred years, or um, uh, are pretty well uh, were, were was decided not really to trust them with nuclear bombs, and so uh, I think they're part of NATO's uh, umbrella in terms of nuclear. But uh, the French have gone for nuclear in a big way. We've gone for nuclear in the British way. Which is uh, we've built we've built a few and then uh, decided that they were far too expensive to maintain, and uh, so basically we've allowed them just to wear out, and, and uh, nobody's interested in building any more. Certainly, the government doesn't want to build any, and you know the Chinese don't want to build any, and the French 
who are perhaps got the expertise that we have and really don't want to invest in the UK to build any, especially now we've come out of Europe. So, but but despite all that, it's quite clear that nuclear, not so much in terms of the big um, plants like Hinkley, but possibly smaller, more sort of local plants that that uh, power power a city or something. Um, my it's the only way forward because what's the alternative you know we want to get rid of coal we want to get rid of uh, natural gas we want to get uh, uh, so solar power in the UK is a joke in Puerto Rico it's brilliant all whole of Puerto Rico could be powered with solar but um, due to the uh, massive interests over there this sort of nine billion dollars that the federal government has given Puerto Rico to restore their uh, hurricane ravaged power supply is now going to um, probably going to be spent on restoring the oil and gas infrastructure that they lost rather than putting a solar panel on every house which was would, would more than adequately supply more than enough power for everywhere but uh, so that's the way it's going put some lights on because everyone's got the lights on it's very dark this is this is why solar power is so laughable in this country you know I've got a friend who's thinking of installing solar power, but he's got more money than money than sense. So, and the only way uh, the government can do these things is by subsidising them. So they're talking about, you know, they, they at one point they almost completely subsidised uh, solar panels to the extent where they paid you the, to put the solar panel up and then um, allowed you to sell your electricity back to the grid, even if you used it yourself. I mean, it really was ridiculous. So. So 30 years ago with Mensa, I went on a tour of uh, Dungeness Power Station, which is just up the coast. And uh, Dungeness is um, was uh, in a major nuclear power station, although I don't know how much it's doing now, probably not much. And um, although I still think it is working, the generator hall was still working when I was there, because I remember having to put on headphones. And um, you know, and they were quite proud about the fact that nuclear was uh, uh, very clean, very efficient, produced a minimal amount of waste, which wasn't really, it was not really too much trouble. They said about a suitcase full of nuclear waste per person per year, which is not really, I mean, considering that we th I throw away a suitcase worth of rubbish um, per person per week. Uh, when the when the bin men come, you know, it's, it's really not at all a problem. Um, so it was quite clear 30 years ago that nuclear was the future, and yet it's taken these dumbasses 30 years to realise that uh, that nuclear is is probably the best option. You know, uh, there's a kestrel. Look. You can tell they're kestrel because they sort of hover, and also they. They're fairly small. Uh, they're looking for uh, mice and stuff in the the grass. This is Manson Airport. This is where they come to get their breakfast. So, so where's this all going? You, I mean, the point is, I mean, apart from the general point that if you think about long, something for long enough, then basically you will uh, understand it or come to a decision on it. Um, in fact what happens is market forces tend to intervene uh, after enough time you know I mean in dentistry at the moment you've got the collapse of the National Health Service which is entirely predictable and you've got the collapse of the private uh, corporate sector which very closely mirrors the NHS because they want the big NHS contracts they don't want they don't want 5,000 individual contracts that have been awarded to 5,000 individual practices they want one big contract from the commissioners for 5,000 practices and uh, in order to do that they have to jump to the NHS tune you know so basically NHS and corporate funnily enough is a, a very a marriage of uh, public and private sector where the private sector very much has to sort of work down to the standards of the NHS of, of, uh, of um, NHS dentistry if they to, to have any chance and you might say well why would they do that? You know? Why is there money to be made in doing worse dentistry? And the sad fact of the matter is that there is, in fact, 
there is in fact money to be made in doing worse dentistry. <laughs> that is where the, the big money is. Doing large amounts of worse dentistry is how to make big money in dentistry. And that's why the corporates are, are in dentistry. So how does that work? Well, <clears throat> what you can do, let's say, let's say you make a pound on a thousand people. Um, you're better off uh, than making uh, 500 pounds on one. And uh, NHS incomes are um, outstrip incomes in the private sector and, and have for the every year that I've known about the figures. So in order to go into the private sector in dentistry, you have to take a, a big, quite a big pay cut. You know? <laughs> <coughs> and not only that, um, practices with big NHS contracts tend to sell for more than uh, private practices with uh, large private turnovers on the basis that the relationship between the patients and the practice is very much mediated through the principal, if he's a private principal. And, uh, you know, so, and, and my dentist can't just buy a private practice and stick any old dentist in there and not expect the turnover to go down so they won't pay so much for them. Whereas with a, with a private practice, they can very much buy any old, sorry, sorry, with an NHS practice, they can very much buy any old NHS practice, stick any old practitioner in there and expect the turnover to stay exactly the same because it's set by the NHS uh, in terms of their, their, their contract. And at the moment, they're still only um, expected to achieve 65% uh, of their pre-COVID workload in return for 100% of their pre-COVID income. So you're on quite a decent screw. If you're on the NHS, it was even better. It was 100% of your income for, for sitting by the phone and handing out um, penicillin like Smarties uh, uh, a year ago. But um, the NHS, just strangely, the Treasury, which was always very, you know, oh no, you can't have a pay rise because we expect, we expect to see a lot more productivity for that. You know, all of a sudden, He's just uh, quite happy to hand out large amounts of money and um, and uh, you know which are basically ending up in the hands of um, uh, the people who make Amoxil and uh, the people who make Durafan, which is the only uh, sort of and when I went to the nice meetings in um, in uh, Birmingham, I think, or were they Manchester? I think they were Birmingham. Um, talking about uh, prevention and general practice, and uh, come on, I've let you out. Stop fiddling about with your mobile phone. You know the the the, um, the people who were there, the lobbyists, were from Johnson and Johnson. There was only. I think real one one real lobbyist there. That and the um, uh, toothpaste companies go there a lot, and I'm sure they know what hotel that the uh, delegates stay at, and I'm sure that they're in the bar in the evening, you know, having a chat with them and everything, and telling them what they can do for them in terms of uh, preferential pricing. I don't know this. I'm alleging this. <laughs> it is alleged. <laughs> All I know is, um, if you go back to my original podcast about the NICE meetings, you'll know that when we started reporting honestly what they were doing, they started holding, uh, in my opinion, allegedly, a pre-meeting meeting, meeting at, which, at which they made all the major decisions and then, and then stopped discussing anything in the open forum. So, so what's, this, what's this piece of the jigsaw that I've finally come up with? What's this... What's the next thing that old Mad Watty's going to do? What, 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 are, what are we going to be a first mover on? What are we going to do that nobody else has thought of before? You know, like, for example, running on time, or which we already do, have done for five years, or um, getting patients to pay in advance so that we get zero PFAs. Uh, well, I've run out of time. I can't tell you, because I'm at work. But I'll tell you, I shall probably tell you on the way home. Because I'm doing two a day at the moment. Anyway, getting lots of walnuts. Not that you care, but 
I'm happy about it. I'll um, see you soon. All right, bye.